Crystal Palace Relics. Mrs. Richardson of New York obtained a number of curiosities very valuable for a cabinet, produced by the melting of the building. What she now offers to visitors is interesting souvenirs of all that remains of the finest building ever erected in America. A building made entirely of glass and iron, except the floors, and supposed to be almost wholly free from danger of fire, yet it was utterly destroyed in 15 minutes' time. From an advertisement for a sale of Crystal Palace souvenirs. Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. I hope that everybody had a great week. I don't think I have any updates at the top of the show. No new weird developments around my apartment. And as far as I'm concerned, no news is good news there. So let's go ahead and get into today's topic, which is part two of the look at the Crystal Palace in New York. Real quick, before we get into it, I just want to mention, like I did last week, my main source for this is a book called The Finest Building in America. I linked to it in the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com. I really relied very heavily on that book for the research for this episode, so if you're interested in learning more about the Crystal Palace, I highly recommend the book. It's really interesting, there's lots of cool pictures, and it's short, so it's easy to read. You might remember from last time, things were not going well for the Crystal Palace. They were in a lot of debt. They had just hired a new board and had brought on P.T. Barnum, the famous showman, to turn things around. So Barnum made a lot of sense as a board member. He was very rich, and more importantly, he knew how to put on a good show and draw people in. You know, that's what he was famous for. He was also famous for his hoaxes and weird novelty displays, like the time he displayed a Fiji mermaid that was really a mummified monkey sewn onto a fishtail, among many other hoaxes and creative flourishes that he had designed to charm the masses. And like I mentioned last week, Barnum was a controversial figure to be on the board. I think that a lot of the opposition to Barnum being on the board was that he was, you know, he was kind of a crass showman who didn't seem to despise ordinary people at least not in the way that a lot of wealthy people did. If the goal of the exhibition was to train people to have good taste, then bringing Barnum, who was known for being ridiculous and a hoaxer, etc., bringing Barnum on was not exactly a recipe for that. One stockholder said that the palace should be, quote, an arena for artistic competition and not a mere toy shop for common huckstering, as a dig against Barnum. Barnum wasn't totally thrilled with the idea of being involved either, though. Originally, back in 1851, he'd actually been asked to create the New York Crystal Palace, but Barnum thought it was a bad idea. He said that the event and the construction of the palace was way too soon after London's Crystal Palace. He felt that more time needed to elapse between the two, and he just felt that it was going to lose money. And, you know, he was right. Barnum claims that he took on his new role on the Crystal Palace board, much against my own judgment, and a week after he joined, he was asked to become president of the Crystal Palace Association. He agreed grudgingly, but he demanded to examine the books, and he said that he would quit if he didn't like what he saw. I guess he was okay with the books, because he did spend a few months trying to revitalize the Crystal Palace. He loaned what were supposedly large amounts of his personal fortune to the association so they could pay the creditors. He got a $40,000 mortgage on the Crystal Palace in exchange for that. He raised money by getting hotels and railroads to buy tons of tickets in advance, which I assume they were going to resell to visitors to New York. He also let exhibitors show their wares for free and advertise their prices. So that sort of made it more like a mall than a museum. Barnum also negotiated with train and steamboat companies to get reduced fares between New York and popular vacation spots like Newport and Cape May. He made admission cheaper, and he said that the refreshment saloons should have reasonably priced snacks. So, you know, he made a lot of changes to make the Crystal Palace appeal more to the average person. Who doesn't like reasonably priced snacks? So he also made alterations to the building, he closed it for a month, and then he scheduled what was going to be a big re-inauguration. Later he would claim that he, quote, never labored so hard night and day, 
Things went better for Barnum than for the previous president. It seems like Barnum knew what he was doing, and the original Crystal Palace Association seemed like they were just like fail sons who had no idea what they were doing. Oh, and I realize I use the term fail son a lot. That might not be a term that is used universally everywhere, so just to define that, a fail son or fail daughter is the child of a wealthy person who then is good for nothing and just kind of flounders around and gets a make-work job and does a bad job at it. So, you know, kind of describing the sort of person who might be on the Crystal Palace Association. Like I said, things went better for Barnum than for the previous president, but he still encountered issues. The publisher of Scientific American sued the association, saying that it had borrowed too much money and that violated its charter. And an injunction related to that made it hard to settle the association's debts. I know that's confusing. I don't totally understand it. But that's apparently what happened. Let's just say there was legal and financial issues. Please don't ask me to explain exactly what that means. Also, a six-person envoy from England had checked out the Crystal Palace, and they published their very negative report about the exhibition. And, you know, to be fair, the exhibition was kind of a mess. For example, when the group got to the States, the exhibition wasn't even ready, so the group had to split up and travel all over the country while killing time before they could go back to the exhibition and see it and write about it. And the stuff they had to say about it, you know, was not nice, was not good. So the night before the big reopening in May 1854, there was a very heavy rainstorm, but apparently Barnum was there the next day for the opening, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, waving his umbrella around and getting everyone into position. There was a parade that included a band and veterans and clergymen, government employees, tradesmen, all sorts of respectable people. The crowd of 10,000 people who gathered at Reservoir Square to watch the parade was smaller than expected, and when it started drizzling again, people with tickets went inside to listen to a ton of speeches, but those speeches were mostly inaudible because of the acoustics of the building, which were truly awful. Also, since people couldn't hear, they kept leaving and chattering and moving around, which made it even harder to hear anything. So not the biggest success with its grand reopening. But Barnum had some ideas to draw people in. He started doing some new programming, including Sunday concerts. Of course, newspapers said that the concerts disrespected the fact that Sunday was the Sabbath and they were kind of panned for that reason. But, you know, at these concerts, even though there were like 1,500 performers, people really couldn't hear anything, again, because the acoustics of the building were terrible. They tried some other things, so they hired a famous balloonist to take off from the Crystal Palace grounds, but the balloonist crashed in Queens, fell out of the basket, and lost the balloon, which kept going on without him until it ran out of steam and grounded itself in Connecticut. There were some interesting things about the new exhibits. My favorite anecdote is that Alicia Otis demonstrated his safety mechanism for freight elevators, so it was an automatic brake that stopped the car from plummeting to the bottom of the shaft in the event of a broken cable. And his demonstration elevator was very tall, so it had to take the place of honor beneath the dome, where Otis apparently would ride up and down, occasionally cutting the rope to demonstrate the brake's effectiveness. So I find that fun. And it's also an important invention, because the brake allowed elevators to be more of a thing, which allowed skyscrapers to be a thing, which was huge in New York, obviously. So, you know, that's that's an influential invention there on display. However, by July 1854, Barnum ended up resigning because his changes hadn't really made a difference. And, you know, it sounds like he did work really hard on it, tried everything he could think of to try. Barnum told a friend, I was an ass for having anything to do with the Crystal Palace. You know, I guess he knew better. And he was right. The next president of the association was a lawyer and trustee. The association decided to close the exhibition in October and then auction off any unclaimed items. 
After the announcement that the exhibition would close, even fewer people visited the Crystal Palace. And by fall of 1854, Harper's called the palace a, quote, glittering mausoleum of happy hopes and betrayed confidences. Grim. There was a lot of debate about what to do with the building. Some people said that they should tear it down and sell it for scrap. Some people said they should move it to Philadelphia, which I find very funny. They're like, eh, we don't really want this building anymore. What are we going to do? Eh, let's pawn it off on Philly. <laughs> they didn't do either of those things, though, but things were looking bad for the Crystal Palace. So when they set up the auction for unclaimed items, no one was interested in buying any of them. So they just had to cancel the event. Not everyone was happy that it was closing. The Ohio State Journal said, In spite of all the sneers upon it, the exhibition has been most important to the country. It will be a long time before we again see such a magnificent and beautiful edifice as the palace, or such a collection of statuary and paintings as have been on exhibition there. Which I think is a really good point, right? The Metropolitan Museum wasn't going to open until 1870, so it was going to be a while before New York City had another big museum. Because I don't think there are any other major art museums in the city before the Met, not that I've been able to find. So that is a loss, I think. Okay, so now what? It's a sad situation, right? There's this beautiful building, nobody really knows what to do with it. Since the exhibition fizzled out, and investors were wary about being burned again. Like I mentioned last time, when the palace first opened, there were a lot of sideshows and businesses catering to the Crystal Palace's clientele. But... At this point, they mostly moved on now that the show had closed, and that left the Crystal Palace on its own, kind of in the middle of nowhere, in the shadow of the reservoir. The Ladding Observatory went out of business. That's, you know, the big tower next to the Crystal Palace. The observatory was purchased by a marble company who inexplicably removed the top 75 feet of the tower. Go figure. The exhibits had been cleared out of the Crystal Palace, and where enormous crowds had once thronged, a single cashier manned the palace. For 25 cents, curious visitors could come and walk around the empty building, which sounds awesome to me. The Crystal Palace Association was dissolved, and its assets were given to a receiver who needed to either find a new place to move the palace or give it to the city per the palace's lease, because the palace was leasing land from the city. People suggested that the city council should tear down the palace or turn it into a produce market, museum, or train station, you know, something respectable. I actually think those are all three great ideas, because there's nothing I love more than produce markets, museums, or train stations. And that would have been an awesome train station. Also, for context, around this time, the economy took a turn. So there had been a boom in the early 1850s, but by the winter of 54 to 55, things were getting grim with tons of layoffs, evictions, etc. That caused a lot of civil unrest, and tensions were very high between the rich and the poor. And, you know, labor leaders asked for things like rent freezes and guaranteed employment, and wealthy New Yorkers ignored their cries. So, things were chaotic in New York City at the time. Meanwhile, the Scientific American publisher was still suing Barnum and airing all of the dirty laundry of the association's bad management and missteps. So, you know, everyone's losing face here. And they still didn't know what the building would be used for. So in June 1855, a giant tree from California, marketed as Washingtonia Gigantia, or Monster Tree of California, was shipped to New York in pieces. So basically, like, they sliced up the tree and then had these round, you know, like, cylindrical pieces they had to cut it up because the sequoia was 300 feet tall, 31 feet wide, and it was supposedly older than the pyramids. It supposedly was from Moses' time. It was revealed on July 4th, and 7,000 people paid 25 cents to see it. There wasn't much excitement, or not as much as they expected at least, and because the tree was sliced up with the pieces stacked on top of each other, People thought that this was probably a hoax, right? Like it was probably pieces of a bunch of different trees stuck together to make a really big tree, to have a big exhibit. People just weren't buying it. However, later, the tree left the Crystal Palace and they shipped it overseas to London and it was exhibited at London's Crystal Palace where people were a lot more into it for whatever reason. 
but in New York, the tree was a bust. So next, they tried renting out the palace for conventions and stuff. So like the Association of Publishers had an event there. There was an inventor's convention there. I feel like this story is so steampunk, right? Like hot air balloons, inventor's conventions in a crystal palace, etc. I find that delightful. There were also a few weddings held at the Crystal Palace, which sounds awesome. The American Institute moved its annual fair there. This fair was very popular, though it had done poorly when it was happening at the same time as the exhibition in 1853. Since, you know, that was stiff competition, people wanted to see the Crystal Palace, like the literal building, and so the American Institute's fair suffered. So in 1855, when they had their fair at the Crystal Palace, it was a huge hit, and the organizers even said that it had been profitable. They had more art and industrial items to exhibit, and a lot of the best pieces of artwork from the exhibition were also at this fair. They kept the two saloons open for refreshments, which I assume were affordably priced. The Sequoia was still there at that point, so for anyone who wanted to see it, they could see that then. There was a beautiful display of fruits and flowers, and there were also, you know, there were cool gadgets, like a steam-powered wood-splitting machine, an automatic grain scale, there was an elevated railroad that constantly ran around the interior of the building above visitors' heads, there was a window-washing device and a, quote, petticoat lifter that made it easier for women wearing hooped skirts to go up and down stairs, which, if you need a special device to make your clothes easier to wear probably you shouldn't be wearing those clothes. You can see why that went out of style. They also held contests, like they held a competition between fire engines, which was won by a water pumper who was able to shoot a stream of water up 162 feet along the side of what was left of the Ladding Observatory. The fair was such a hit that the Institute tried to buy the building, but they couldn't settle on a price with the court-appointed receiver, but they did continue to hold the fair there for the next few years. So around the beginning of 1856, the receiver tried to renew the five-year lease that the palace had with the city. That seemingly simple thing became a huge issue because different people wanted to do different things with the palace. But long story short, the lease was not renewed. Then in August 1856, in a moment of foreshadowing, the Ladding Observatory burned down in a fire that also destroyed more than 24 tenements, leaving what I assume must have been hundreds of families homeless during, you know, a bad time in the economy with winter approaching. That is awful. But while a bunch of tenements were damaged, the Crystal Palace was mostly unhurt. Some hot embers had landed on the roof, and the heat of the fire melted off some of the solder between glass panels. In early 1857, the lease on the land that the Crystal Palace stood on expired, officially, and the receiver tried to sell the palace to the city. The building had cost more than $700,000 to build, and the parts could be sold for scrap for $80,000. And so the receiver said that he would sell it to the city for an incredibly cheap $150,000. But some people believed that since the palace was now on city land because they'd lost the lease, the city owned the palace. There then ensued a bunch of fighting during which the palace began to decay, because nobody wanted to take responsibility for maintaining it. Because, you know, if one person's like, oh, maybe they own it and should maintain it, and the other person is like, oh, they own it and should maintain it, I guess it was kind of like a hot potato. No one wanted to handle it. And, you know, it was a high-maintenance building. For reference, they would have needed to hire 40 full-time glaziers just to keep the glass in the building, which is bananas. The city council looked into it, And they found that thousands of screws and maybe millions of bolts that held together the building had become terribly rusted, meaning that it would take about a year to take the building apart if they wanted to, you know, disassemble it. And again, like I mentioned, things were not going well in the city. Poor people kept getting poorer, etc., etc. The wealthy people in New York City were becoming more and more afraid of poor people. And in August of 1857, the Panic of 1857 began when the Ohio Life Insurance and Trust, a really solid bank whose president had been on the board of the Crystal Palace Association, went down because the company had made risky loans and the manager had taken to lining his pockets with company money. The resulting credit squeeze took down hundreds of other financial institutions, and by mid-October, the banks were unsteady, business had ground to a standstill, half the Wall Street brokers were now unemployed, 
and Europe and South America were also suffering. Does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> Perhaps from 13 years ago, about? So by November, tens of thousands of working men and women in New York City were out of work, and, you know, winter's coming. The mayor of New York City hired unemployed people to work on big city projects like Central Park, and the laborers were paid in cornmeal, potatoes, and flour because, you know, they were, like, starving. Only a few thousand people were hired in this program, but of course the mayor was accused of being a communist. You know, for getting people to pay for not even money, like subsistence, foods. You're not going to thrive on cornmeal, potatoes, and flour, but you probably won't die. But even that was being too soft on the poor people. And remember that, much like today, the ultra-wealthy thought that charity was about showing up at a fancy ball or gala, not making sure that people had jobs and got paid and could eat. So, because rich people love a ball, a, quote, colossal charity soiree happened at the Crystal Palace in April of 1858. It was a huge event, and 10 to 15,000 people crowded into the Crystal Palace. It seemed like everything was going okay until around 1 a.m., when a huge number of people, ready to go home, went into the cloakroom, and there was absolute chaos. They turned over barricades, they knocked down shelves, wealthy gentlemen began to brawl, many women fled to the street, leaving behind their coats. Around 3.30 a.m., several hours into the melee, two men got into a knife fight, though they weren't seriously injured. So, you know, we're seeing all these wealthy people behave just like the uncouth poor people who they loved to vilify. Then, after all that, it turns out that most of the money raised in the event had gone missing, and instead lined the pockets of the people who organized the event. And the charitable society who had created the gala also conveniently vanished. So to recap, this party that was supposedly for charity just ended up being charity for already wealthy con men, and then turned into a drunken brawl that would rival any that may have happened in, you know, parts of town that the wealthy wouldn't be caught dead in. So the Crystal Palace right there is symbolizing a lot of things that were wrong with New York, both then and now, if we're being honest. In case you're wondering, the economy would eventually get better, you know, once the Civil War started. Seems like wars seem to do good things for the economy. But in the meantime, before that, the Crystal Palace continued to slowly fall apart. So during the summer of 1858, a huge chandelier that had been suspended from the dome fell down. No one was hurt, but you know, when chandeliers start falling out of your ceiling, that's a bad sign. In 1858, the new mayor of New York City proclaimed that the city owned the Crystal Palace and that they would take it apart if the receiver didn't do it by May 1858. The mayor ended up sending out the police and the controller who took possession of the palace and confiscated $100,000 worth of property in addition to the palace. The city didn't demolish the palace, though. It hosted a celebration of a transatlantic cable in 1858. And then on a fateful day, October 5th, 1858, as the American Institute Fair was just starting up for that year, the Crystal Palace burned down. We aren't totally sure why it burned down, but here's what we do know. It happened during the day when people were inside, but luckily everyone escaped and no one was seriously injured. The fire broke out in a storeroom. The official narrative is that an arsonist started the fire because people were confused about how a building made of mostly steel and glass, which was supposed to be fireproof, could burn down so quickly. Because this fire happened really, really fast, way faster than a building built of less fireproof materials would have burned down, this was suspicious. Like, literally, the New York Times said, quote, its destruction was more rapid than any building of wood could possibly have been. There are some stories about a man in a dark coat leaving the storeroom with his hat pulled down to hide his face, and conjecture was that he was hired by local landowners who didn't like how seedy the area had become. But that's not what I think happened. This is an Occam's razor thing for me, and I believe the account of an eyewitness who had a much more plausible account, even if this account was hushed up a bit. So this unnamed eyewitness told the New York Times that he'd heard someone say they were going to light the gas, and then right after that he heard shouts of fire. Here's what he said. I saw streams of fire like snakes running in all directions through the building and setting it on fire nearly as fast as a man could run. 
The color of the smoke, the intensity of the flame, and two or three small explosions forces the idea to my mind that, to save a few dollars, the gas pipes of the Crystal Palace had only been gutta percha instead of wrought iron tubes, and that shortly after the gas was turned on, there was a leak somewhere in the rear of the north nave, which set fire to the gas tubes, which was the true and legitimate cause of this lamentable disaster. Gutta percha is latex, by the way, so not the same thing as iron. The witness returned to the scene the next day after the palace burned down and searched for evidence of iron tubes, but didn't see them, which is a little weird since there had been 30,000 feet of gas lines in the Crystal Palace. Of course, the firm that installed the gas lines said that they were made of wrought iron with lead fittings and that they were inspected and in good condition. But we already know that the builders of the Crystal Palace wanted to cut corners and save money. For example, during construction, it wasn't uncommon for materials like metal beams to arrive and be in the wrong length, forcing workmen to have to use a method called cut and try, which is exactly what it sounds like. You cut something and then try and see if it works. However, that's something that's used for carpentry, not precise metalwork. The American Phrenological Journal said that, quote, every part of the Crystal Palace had to be more or less sprung in order to bring the parts into place. The author of The Finest Building in America suggests that maybe construction techniques hadn't caught up to the new materials being used in the palace's construction, which seems very plausible to me. But I do think that the contractors were lying about the pipe for the gas being iron. It wouldn't be the first time that someone lied under oath. And I also wouldn't be surprised if the Crystal Palace Association who built the Crystal Palace knew it all along. That could be a reason for the story of arson spreading so far and wide. You want to spread the idea that it was arson, not your own mismanagement, greed, etc. that was responsible for this disaster. But whatever happened, the Crystal Palace was no more. One detail I wanted to share was a description in the New York Times of what the palace sounded like burning down, which was the sound of, quote, the cracking of glass and roaring of wind and flames as they rushed up through the roof and sides of the building, which is just so evocative to me. The New York Tribune said, we shall never have another Crystal Palace. Its glorious dome is no more. Its galleries, its treasures, its magnificent expanses, indispensable to the mass gatherings of the great metropolis, its superb memories are all gone and gone forever. An enterprising woman named Mrs. Richardson, whose advertisement I read from in the beginning of this episode, was an exhibitor whose display had been destroyed in the fire. So she sold lumps of melted glass and iron from the ruins, you know, describing them as curiosities very valuable for a cabinet. I love the idea of having like a block of melted glass from the Crystal Palace in your cabinet of curiosities. It's delightfully Victorian. So nobody really wanted to rebuild the palace since it had been almost as good as slated for destruction. You know, the fire kind of did the city's job for it. And I think it's fair to say that the Crystal Palace in many ways was sort of a failure, at least in the eyes of people back then. I've always really been fascinated by the Crystal Palace it looks so beautiful. There's almost no pictures that exist of it. I think the only picture that exists is a picture of it being under construction. Most of the images of it are just engravings. You know, I love the Crystal Palace. I love old Coney Island. Like, I love the idea of old world's fairs. I find it fun to think of it as, you know, this glimpse into what was supposed to be the future. And, you know, it was tied to things that had a big impact on New York City. You know, it created tourism in New York and popularized, you know, coming into the city to see some sights. There was the Otis safety mechanism for the elevator that allowed skyscrapers to be built in New York City. And, you know, while they did a terrible job building the palace, it did introduce a new way of building things, you know, like these buildings of glass and iron. So I think it had an impact. However, the city moved on, and the Crystal Palace, which had gained for a time so much acclaim and fascination back in its early days, it was totally forgotten. And as the author of The Finest Building in America says, even before Reservoir Square became Bryant Park, a leafy oasis in the concrete desert of midtown Manhattan, what had been the most famous destination in the United States was all but forgotten. It had been the subject of no more than a handful of scholarly articles 
and earns, at best, passing mention in a few standard narratives of the period. Which is totally true. It's kind of hard to find information about the Crystal Palace, which is part of why I think this book is so great. The Finest Building in America by Edwin G. Burroughs. If you're interested in the Crystal Palace at all, after listening to this, you should definitely pick it up. You know, it's the author's small attempt to try to correct the travesty of everyone having forgotten about the Crystal Palace. And it's a really interesting read. So that's the story of the Crystal Palace. I hope you enjoyed hearing about it. It's kind of a weird story, but feels very relevant in so many ways. The more things change, the more things stay the same, I guess. So if you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends about the podcast. Please rate and review the podcast on your podcatcher of choice. You can check out the show's Instagram at Buried Secrets Podcast. I'll probably post a few pictures of the palace on fire, that sort of thing. You can also check out the show notes with all of the sources for this episode, as well as some images of the Crystal Palace. You can check that out at BuriedSecretsPodcast.com. You can write to me at BuriedSecretsPodcast at gmail.com. And thanks so much for listening.